Okay, uh, good evening, good afternoon, uh, good morning, wherever you are. This is uh, the Pundit Show from Focuswire. Um, we've been uh, kind of quiet for a couple of months. We first uh, did the Pundit Shows, we did eight of them at the Focus Right conference back in November last year, and we had a very glitzy studio and a film crew and cameras, and we did, as I say, eight of these uh, Pundit Shows where we got a group of people pretending it's like the... Uh, you know, the retired professional footballers or baseball players who convene at half time during the match to debate the issues of the day. We've taken the concept over to travel tech and the digital travel economy and we over the next weeks, months, years, whatever whatever we're going to do with these, we will gather similar types of people, uh, but not ex professionals, they are professionals still in the game, industry experts to chat about some of the things that are going on. So this is number nine. Obviously, this isn't video. It's uh, nowhere near as glitzy as it was back in November. But you have got me, uh, for better or worse, Kevin May, the editor-in-chief of Focus Wire. And for number nine, uh, we have uh, Robert Cole, Stephen Joyce, and Valen Perini, old friends of uh, Focus Wire. They all appeared in those uh, during the course of those first dates. So we thought, given that we were making our, uh, I guess, re-debut, we would have them back. So uh, good afternoon, uh, Robert, uh, Stephen and Valen. How are you all? We're Very doing well. well. And we were the stars of those shows. That's why we were invited to this one. Is that, <laughs> is that correct, Kevin? Uh, yes, that was, that's on my notes here as a footnote to mention that you were the stars. Um, you've obviously, uh, uh, you've beat me to it. So thank you very much for that. Um, these are going to be a bit more, di a bit different from the uh, the previous pundit shows, where it's less about me interviewing a panel and more about the four of us having a chat. So we'll do some housekeeping here and there. But uh, you know, the, the, I guess the, the the agenda is that we just pick up on a couple of topics that are doing the rounds uh, this week or this month, and we'll see what our our guests, our pundits, have got to say. Um, one of the things that we'll be doing over the next weeks is inviting you the audience and uh, anyone else who wants to take part to just get in touch uh, kmay at focuswire.com and just let us know if you want to appear on the show but uh, enough of the kind of the housekeeping items and um, i suppose what's been interesting uh, our intrepid trio i don't think we get to our first topic here i don't think i can remember for a good few years a subject or a trend that has happened almost overnight and I talk about what has been going on with Airbnb in the last few weeks uh, beginning of February it was just rolling along as doing all the things that it does and then all of a sudden they made an announcement that they were going to be connecting through SiteMinder and since then maybe fueled by the likes of us in the media it appears to become a hot topic now interestingly um, Valen and Stephen, I saw you both uh, recently at the ITB conference in Berlin, and Nate, the co-founder of Airbnb, did a did a keynote there, and his room that he was doing his keynote in was packed. They locked the doors, and I counted roughly a hundred plus people standing outside watching his speech on big video screens outside. It has become again the brand of the moment, and I wonder if we could just kind of throw that around as to why we think that is. Is it based purely on that announcement? Is it on other things? Um, I mean, Valen, you were there with me in Berlin. I can't, I can't remember if you said, if you were at Nate's speech or not, but it seems to be the topic of the moment. The reason that it's, it's stirred up so much controversy in the hotel space is because Airbnb has, after years of fighting hoteliers, um, has put itself squarely on the side of hoteliers against the OTAs. Um, and that tactic is fascinating because suddenly hoteliers don't really know what to do with it. Um, and so, but, but to have a fighter or a, or a player on their side as big as Airbnb is with the market reach that they have, you know, uh, it, can't, it can't be all bad. But I know lots of hoteliers are really divided on how to think about this. So are, are they really on the side of the of the hoteliers though? I mean, it's another distribution channel, you know, for for these hotels and not all hotels too. I mean, we're talking about a curated set of hotels, even through um, SiteMinder. They they made it very clear that it, that they're not just going to allow any hotel to be listed. It's very very specific types of you know unique boutique hotels that they right. want 
listed in their set. Um, but I mean, you know, they're still charging a fairly hefty margin and they're, Yes, it's a marketing opportunity, but are they really any different from an, from any other OTA? Well, interesting. Oh, it's a good point, Steve. I mean, when they made the announcement, they one of the kind of the the tip sheets that they forwarded to to the press was this um, talk about commissions, and they made a big thing about the OTAs charging very very high commissions, double digit figures, and they specifically said, and this was, I guess, the first salvo, for want of a better word in the direction of the OTAs by saying we won't be charging anywhere close to those kind of commission levels. So that's where they're trying to, I guess, um, appeal to hotels that they are going to charge lower commissions. Well, well, and that's partially true. I won't go as far as saying it's disingenuous because it, it technically is correct because for even a, a, a standard Airbnb host, the fee is somewhere in the neighborhood of 3% and it can escalate, you know, depending on some other factors. But there's also a service charge for the traveler. So when you aggregate those together, Airbnb is hovering in the 15% range. And that's kind of where where they are, and that's fine. And that is somewhat, yes, you can argue for um, boutique hotels, which are certainly the ones, you know, bed and breakfasts and, and that sort, who are the ones that they're targeting. Yes, they're probably paying you know, slightly more for a, through the OTAs, but that's around when you average everything the OTAs are charging with the large, you know, the large change and everything, probably around the ballpark sort of thing for it. So it's basically the same thing. If you look at the the net rate, you know, the rate net of commission, you know, that the the hotelier receives versus the the amount paid by the the traveler, that's the same. The challenge is for the hoteliers that yes, they're providing either a net rate or a 15% commission or whatever whatever that may be to an OTA. Um, through Airbnb though, they have that fee to the, uh, to the guests. So that's going to be very interesting to see mm. what kind of mm. fees they're charging because it isn't going to be a 3% discount off of, the, off of the rate because that's not going to work with a 12% fee check yeah, exactly. on what's up. And trust me, Airbnb who, yes, they did, defer on their IPO, but they do not want to go into a business that is going to wind up cannibalizing their margins. Um, exhibit A, TripAdvisor. You don't want to go down that path. That does, that's not good. <laughs> the Wall Street doesn't like that. So, I mean, that, 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 um, Valin, I mean, it's just, you, know, you work for a hotel technology company. I mean, what are you, without betraying any confidences, of course, I mean, what are you hearing from some of your OTA, uh, sorry, your, some of your hotel chums. I know you said people are very split, but what is their opinion in, within that split? Well, at this point, it's early enough that they don't really, I mean, there, there's been a lot of talk and it is, it is available. Um, I haven't spoken directly to any hoteliers that are actually distributing via Airbnb at this point. What I get from most people that I talk to is it's uh, wait and see because it, there's some that don't trust uh, Airbnb because they are sort of approaching IPO or talking about IPO, and there are some who've said it's just a ploy, you know, to 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 buck up their cap before they go public. Um, most most hoteliers that I've talked to are, are a bit hands off. What I was interested in is seeing this this sort of volley back from Expedia saying that they bring a premium customer um, yeah. to hotels, sort of mm -hmm. trying to respond to that Airbnb, we're gonna undercut the we're gonna undercut the commissions of the existing large OTAs. I thought that was a that was quite an interesting first Yeah, they said as a story we ran this week, they said mm -hmm. uh, that the, the premium customer as defined by uh, Oxford Economics is one that stays <laughs> longer and spends more. Mm. Right. But that is not a typical OTA customer. That is a typical Airbnb customer. Now, not necessarily spend more. Right. Certainly, yeah, Airbnb right. has a much longer average length of stay overall mm. right. than than Expedia. And Expedia right. certainly has a lower ADR than most other channels, especially when you start when you when you realize it based on the net revenue to the hotel net of commission or or their net rate. Here's so that's generally thing. lower than other channels. So. So here's the other thing I, I, I have an issue with, with with Airbnb selling hotels is that these are hotels that are available through other channels. So if they're selling the same inventory through their channel that's available on Expedia or um, you know Booking.com or wherever, um, but they're tacking on an extra 12%, 
it's cheaper to book that hotel on those other channels. So there's no competitive advantage uh, and there's no price advantage to a consumer booking that product on, on Airbnb versus booking it on Expedia or booking.com. So what's the incentive for a consumer to book a hotel? It's the hope that they, by increasing the, the number of listings in Airbnb, that they'll be able to essentially not upsell, but cross sell to an actual Airbnb property within, you know, while the customer is on Airbnb. So instead of, they'll use the hotels as kind of a lost leader in that case, hoping that, you know, they'll, they'll look for that hotel, they'll come to Airbnb, and they'll eventually switch to an action, to an Airbnb property versus one of the, the you know, uh, properties that's, that's pulled in through SiteMinder or something like that. In which case, then if that is their strategy, then there really is no benefit to the hoteliers because all they're getting is eyeballs. But, you know, ultimately the end goal is to get them to book an Airbnb property. I haven't seen anything, Robert. Have you regarding display of hotels versus um, whole houses or rooms? No. And Airbnb has some s pretty sophisticated right. um, machine learning. that, And that is a huge challenge for Airbnb that they've fo been focused on for five years at least, yeah, yeah. is trying to figure out what is that best sort order that best suits that particular customer, right, at, at that particular time. So they're trying to figure out signals from, you know, where they're located, where they're going, how long is the stay, how far, you know, what would be the best bundle of services. But I think what they're looking at, it is somewhat in, in preparation for their IPO because they're looking at Booking.com, who's going heavy into right. into vacation rentals and, and shared um, – Oh, and, and shared um, short-term rentals, and with that, they ha they're a subset, and that's not a good position to be. So I think they don't want the airport Marriott or the La Quinta on the highway out on I-80 somewhere necessarily. Now maybe eventually they will if they if they want to do that, but that's not really it. I think they want cool, neat properties that are small. You know, if you're if you're going up. Um, to the San Juan Islands in, in Washington State, and you want to stay on Orcas Island, hey, there are Airbnbs, there are cool little B&Bs, there's all sorts of stuff, which is which is great. And they want to get into that sort of thing. The same thing in, you know, if you go to New York City, there are, there are cool little independent hotels that you might not know about, and that's, and that's great. The question will be, how big do they go? How mainstream do they go? That'll start getting kind of interesting of how they do that. But again, they're also trying to segment with this um, uh, the Airbnb plus they're they're trying to segment this out and say hey this is a great place for a wedding this is a great place for you know various personas of uh, various traveler personas so I think they'll try to figure it out um, that way as as well of how you wind up getting presented to be the best fit for what that traveler is is wanting to do so here's a question then I mean based based on what you've just said Robert when you say, are they going to go for a slightly more specialist thing? Will there be an urge or um, a, a need for them to go for scale at some point, especially if they go public because there is a, you know, they need to show growth and higher revenues and things like that. So they, they could be forced into going into that eventually. Oh, I, I think so. I Well, Certainly, Airbnb started out as people forget they think it's bed and breakfast. No, it was airbed. It was an yeah. inflatable bed on, on Brian Chesky's floor, right, for a for a design conference. So it was it was true shared accommodation, host present. You are sharing the same living space. They've found over time most travelers don't really like that. Now there is a group that is, and that's very unique and it's great. And they, they love it and people have great experiences. And that's a really interesting dynamic of pairing the host to the guest, not just a, a, a lodging unit to a guest, but a, an actual host guest relationship. So that's good. Vast majority of their sales are are whole unit owner absent sort of things, right? They also have where you have the private room, but that's not a large portion. I think it's 85% or, and I may be off on the numbers, and I'm not sure if they even release them publicly, but this is just on hearsay. A, a vast majority of their business is full unit owner is not present um, sort of thing. So that is kind of like a hotel or a vacation rental or, or something like that. Um, but some people also, I guess the differentiation when they're competing also against home away, home away are generally, you know, purpose, 
purposefully vacation rental units so you don't have the owner's stuff there. They might have their furniture, but not their stuff. And so there's a difference. Some people don't want to stay with some people's stuff. And some people don't want to stay in a vacation or only want to stay in a hotel. So I think they're trying to attract, you know, satisfy people who are looking for kind of cool, offbeat, interesting experiences. They're certainly focusing on the whole experiential aspect of travel, which is fantastic and good and what hotel chains should have been doing for the last I don't know, one or two decades. I'm not sure. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, you get into yeah, yeah you get into that, and they're covering they're covering the gamut and going, hey, this person's more comfortable with a hotel. That's great. We've got a really cool right. hotel in Soho in New York, and, and great, stay there. I do want to I do want to say one thing though, uh, and and it's counter to the numbers that, that Robert presented is that when Airbnb goes into a new market or talks to local governments about the, the makeup of their, um, of their properties, they unequivocally state that the majority of their properties are shared properties where the owner is present and where, you know, the owner is basically renting out a space in order to do things like subsidize their rent or subsidize their mortgage. So if oh. that is the message that they're giving the market, that is a very different message than what they're actually Dating oh to no, the I, industry. So. Yeah, I, let me be clear. It's more the the owner cohabiting with you when you are when you're renting the actual unit. So the owners generally aren't there, but they are individual owner rented. Yeah, you know. So I mean, they certainly have gotten into a lot of trouble um, with cities, and cities are still wrestling with how to how to properly regulate the uh, properly regulate them. Where yeah, they have a lot of folks who are running these and management companies who are basically just taking rental units out of Circulation, which in many cases are are desperately needed for affordable housing in some of these okay. some of these cities, they're removing those from the market and just running them as pseudo hotels, and that's certainly what yep. the H and L A and stuff are trying to get rid of those. And, and I think Airbnb realize I think they've realized that for a long time. So yeah, those guys are eventually getting either legislated out or or knocked off the the platform to make it a little bit more. Yes, this is legit individuals individuals right. renting their units, but those guys are not around when these when the vast majority of their guests stays. I mean, the point. private rooms and the shared ones is, is a relatively small portion of their business. So when we spoke to uh, Brian Chesky at their big um, launch of various things in San Francisco two or three weeks ago. A great uh, interview on Focus Wire, which everyone should yes, read. That is uh, outstanding. Yeah. Nobody, nobody else, <laughs> nobody else managed to get an interview with him. We were delighted. But uh, and one of the things that uh, uh, Brian Chesky said um, where, when Jill was talking to him about bed and breakfast and things, he said, "We have 180,000 places to stay on Airbnb that are already classed as B&Bs, but we've had a very fuzzy definition. So we want to clean up the data." And this is the key point. When we're going back to the scale issue, he says, "But I expect us to possibly have as many or more B&Bs one day than Booking.com." So, you know, the, the ambition is there Maybe. for them to scale up, isn't it? <clears throat> mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, because again, a B and B is a little bit between uh, someone's private home and a vacation rental, which might be an individually owned unit, or or a true B and B. And you go to New Orleans, or you go to Charleston, or someplace like that. They have amazing yeah. little B and Bs, which which okay, fundamentally operate kind of like hotels. They are they're little small hotels, um, but they they aren't quite big chain type things, and they're really cool, unique places. And yeah. they would be perfect for the Airbnb customer. And I think the Airbnb customer is going to wind up having a heavy, heavy degree of overlap with what are considered now hotel customers. Indeed, and, and that is changing. Val, Val, let, let me let's 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 flip this. The other way then. So, if you're um, Gillian Tan's uh, uh, boss of uh, Booking.com, or her boss Glenn Fogel, or Mark Hokerstrom from Expedia Inc., what do you think they are doing right now? Watching all this kind of it, maybe erupt is a bit of a strong word, but kind of unfold over the last few weeks. Do you think it's mild bemusement, thinking there's someone who's got the, uh, the the audacity to try and challenge them so publicly, or do you think that they're perhaps worried or not? Well, I would I would say that any potential competitor that shows up in, in anyone's space, um, smart companies pay attention to them. My guess is that, as Stevens pointed out, the, the hotels that they're bringing on initially are curated, right? So they don't want the airport properties. 
um, not now, but to Robert's point, if they want scale, if Airbnb wants scale and they want to compete with Booking and Expedia, they'll have to broaden that definition of of uh, of the type. They'll have to broaden the types of hotels that they bring on, because they're they're if they really want to have a run at one of those two companies, they're going to have to broaden the types of hotels they bring on. Um, so if I was Glenn Fogel or Gillian Tans or or Mark Okerstrom, I would pay close attention. Um, and understand what's going on, but you know, it, it, you just have to watch it, right? Because they may fail, right? Airbnb, this may not work for them, or, it, or they may get enough pushback from hotels or travelers that the model doesn't work right, and they they bail, um, you know, because they may decide that they're where the where they started to play can support them and will support um, a successful IPO and a long term you know, a long and happy business life post-IPO. Right, and pr but presumably they've done some, you know, we ask this question of startups all the time, and they've done some kind of market discovery to figure out how far they can take this and the, and the relative enthusiasm or not from the hotel industry. So presumably they wouldn't have gone out so strongly and saying our new battlefront is against OTAs rather than hotels without being reasonably confident that it's a strategy that they can win. Well, and the reason is they don't want to go acquire content from OTAs and bed banks and that sort of thing. They want to they want a relationship with the host, the hotel owner, sort of thing. So, I think the hotel owners should certainly be considering this and, and take a take a hard look at it and evaluate it. Um, because again, you want to be where the demand is and where the customers who would be appropriate for your for your property are, and if that's Airbnb, so be it. It's the same same thing as the hoteliers or the, you know, some of the digital marketing agencies who go, don't work with OTAs, make people go direct to your website. It's like, well, you can do lots of things to make your website and your mobile app and all those things better, but if they want to book through Booking.com or Expedia, you should probably be there and not try to alter their behavior. That's a right. that's not a great approach to, <laughs> to to a lot of successful businesses have not, you know, or a lot of businesses have not succeeded in that in that sort of approach. Um, uh, so something I mean, to bring Stephen in here on this one. I mean, something that I heard last week in Berlin was um, uh, someone who obviously have to rename. Uh, remain nameless was saying you know is is airbnb potentially trying to do too many things at once and the reason why i say that is because it launched the experiences um product or you know mm -hmm. new division uh a couple of years ago um i think it's 18 months in now isn't it and mm -hmm. it, it, depending on who you ask you get different <laughs> reactions to how well or well that Thing isn't doing, you know that that was a fair undertaking in itself. I mean, from your perspective, Stephen, with your day job hat on for a moment, I mean, how much has that created a fuss in the market, and could that be an indicator to how much the move into hotels may be making a fuss in the market? Well, in the tour and activity space, it hasn't really made much of a fuss. I mean, it, it, people have talked about it, but. Um, the actual number of bookings that have gone through the, the platform, I, I don't know. They've said, I think, a million bookings over the 18-month period, um, and it's cost them something like $100 million so far to, to actually uh, to run the program. Um, but they're working with individual hosts doing very, very specific, small-scale um, experiences. So overall impact on the industry has been negligible, if if any. I mean, really, not much. Um, <clears throat> did they create a, a buzz around it? Definitely, um, because they're Airbnb and they've it's got a great brand. by virtue brand. of who they are, isn't it? Yeah, by virtue of who they are, when they do something, people talk about it. Same thing with the hotel thing. I mean, if any other, if any other company how many companies connect to SiteMinder on a daily basis to distribute hotels? Probably a lot, but because it's Airbnb, everyone's talking about it. So, you know, is it a is it a great long-term strategy? Are they doing it because they can maybe bump up their their market cap before an IPO? Maybe. Maybe they're thinking that you know, with all the fuss around uh, individual properties and the legislation that they have to deal with in, in cities and you know, the same sort of things that, that Uber has to deal with, 
um, that hotels are just a safer bet. And with one hotel, they get 100 rooms, whereas with one Airbnb, it's one room. So the potential right. revenue generated from one hotel is 100 times greater than the revenue that they could generate from one Airbnb, although the work is probably the same um, for them in terms right. of the actual, right. uh, actual you know, administrative or, or uh, payment work. I think well, it's worth, I think it's worth pointing out just just briefly. I mean, Airbnb has disputed that hundred million dollar figure quite heavily to us <laughs> with regards to how much it has spent on uh, on the experiences product. You know, it's uh, yeah. I think it's Where the Wall Street Journal report. Was, was, was that was that reported anywhere? I, I don't. It know was why in the Wall Street. It was in the Wall Street Journal, oh, and they disputed right, right. it straight away. They said yeah. that that figure was not accurate. Well, I mean, there's one. Sorry, there was one other thing that the hotels bring to Airbnb, though, and that's um, public spaces, right? Bars, restaurant, rooftop bars, pools, health clubs, things like that, um, which if you're in a, you know, someone's apartment building may be problematic with different guests going through and interacting with neighbors and things like that. Um, I think there's a very, very interesting dimension here for some of these boutique hoteliers who have maybe a great F&B operation go, oh, now is there a way that we can tap into those Airbnb guests and because they're part of the Airbnb family and working with them, something we can do to get them, you know, to, to have dinner with us, to go hang out at the at the club, um, use the... Um, use the fitness facilities, maybe on a fee basis, something like that, um, if they aren't staying at the hotel. Um, I don't think something like that has been announced, but I would I would certainly imagine that that sort of thing is, is being looked at. Because, again, Airbnb started doing some things with these neighborhood -y bar, you know, coffee shop type things yeah. where you could pick up the keys, right? Because that was one of the one of the obstacles. How do you get the key from the from the host? And I think that was okay, but it wasn't really enough to uh, – they really want to build senses of community. Hello, Robert. Uh, I think we lost Robert. I think we lost Robert there briefly. <laughs> I'm sure he'll be back. He'll probably still be talking, bless him. Anyway. <laughs> 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 I mean, let's uh, let, let's let, let's pretend for a moment that it's a year down the line. Let's just have a bit of a forecast as to how, on a scale of one to ten, of yeah, all those media types were right when they were writing endlessly about Airbnb and hotels. Do you think we were all justified? I mean, let's say in a year's time, do you think it was all probably worth the hype? Do we think this is going to make a mark or not? You know, to your point earlier about Airbnb doing their due diligence before they jumped into this space, um, I believe that that we – I don't know that we'll, we'll still be talking about it, but I think Airbnb will still be in the space. Now, they may, may have to make some tweaks in the coming 12 months to the point of, you know, maybe for hotels they don't do that traveler-facing service charge, or maybe it's a different, it's a different customer-facing model um, that they may, they may have learned a few lessons and had to change that, or they may, they may have to tweak something else in the commercials to make it successful or to get to the point where they want to get. Um, I believe that they'll still be doing it in a year. Um, I, the, whether or not we'll all still be talking about it depends on what changes they make. Steve? Yeah, I, I think they'll still be doing it for, um, in a year from now. I think an experiment like this, and, and I consider this an experiment because they're in the same way that, that the experience is, is an experiment. It's going to take them time to work out the kinks. And so if they, you know, if they, do, if they announce it now and they abandon it in six months, that would be a pity um, because clearly there's an opportunity in the hotel space. So um, I think they're still going to be doing it in a year. Will it, will it be the same thing? I don't know. Is it going to have a significant impact on their revenue? I don't think so. Um, I, I think uh, it's going to take much longer than that. I think you're, we're probably looking two or three years out to, to have any kind of significant impact on that. Robert, are you back? Yes. Yep. Sorry. I think I dropped. I think I dropped out there for a second. You did. Uh, <laughs> the um, actually the. Um, one thing I was going to say is the success when you start looking at, at the hotel groups and the reason that you know Marriott has 30 brands and things like that is is how much footprint do you have in these high demand destinations 
And so if you're in New York, you know, what is the density of your, your rooms? I would think the hotel groups would be fairly concerned with this because a lot of their soft brands and things like that, which may not have been targeting as much the B&Bs, but were out there trying to you know, aggregate in some of, these, uh, some of these boutique hotels and cooler hotels and get them into the program, that may wind up being a challenge. I don't, I don't think the hotel groups are um, looking at this with, with open arms. They, they should be looking at this as a threat because those hotel groups aren't just you know, to a hotel owner. If you're a boutique hotel owner, uh, you aren't just paying, let's say, the 15% to, to Booking.com or Expedia or whoever the OTA, but, you know, I, maybe this is a bad example, but a Hilton Garden, well, no, actually the average, I think, HVS will say the average fees when you calculate in all the fees that you pay to the brand are about 12% in the U.S. of total room revenue. That's a big nut, and, and Airbnb is not is not doing that at all and you don't if you can handle that yourself with your boutique hotel and you don't need to be paying the brand a, a, a big weight in addition to the distribution um, that's going to be an interesting thing so i think the battle with airbnb is really against the hotel brands and and the otas i think they do have a two-front battle but uh, i think they're they're playing it smart by kind of you know saying hey we're fighting the otas and then you know have the hoteliers think oh that's no, good. They aren't fighting with us, but so we're, we're, we're your frenemy <laughs> more than rather than your enemy. Well, hoteliers deal with. Uh, I've said this a number of times. Hoteliers deal with disruption in a specific four-stage process, and this has been since the beginning of time. Stage one is they ignore it. <laughs> <laughs> Stage two is when they are told by, you know, a, an individual like perhaps Kevin May, who says, hey, this looks like something, has published a couple articles on it. Um, they still, they continue to ignore it. So stage two is continuing to ignore the thing. Stage three is they panic. And stage four is they kind of resignedly complain about it because it's too late and they can't do much. They capitulate. And that would be it. Capitulate, yeah, <laughs> grudgingly capitulate. <laughs> I think would be the the appropriate way to describe it. And that really is. And you look at the OTA, you go through all the series of things that have have come up to disrupt them, and that that is how they deal with it. And Airbnb is ten years old, and until what maybe last year, most of the hotel groups said, ah, that's nothing. We aren't worried about it. They go, they've got over a million freaking rooms, guys. I think you – and they have variable supply. Do not ignore any business that has variable supply because that's very, very hard to, so, hard so to deal with. Robert, you need to come up with a graphic for this. Right? Any graphic? <laughs> emojis? Yeah, I could do it with emojis graphic. probably. <laughs> no, Is there a pulling out you know, hair emoji? Yeah. It's like the, it would be like the um, the guest journey graphic, right? It would be one of those yeah. that could be copied over and over and over again. Or exactly. the four really stages like of grief, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. yeah, denial. <laughs> <laughs> Anger, acceptance. <laughs> oh, wait, Valen, you're on to something. We need a 12-step program for these hoteliers. I think that's the... <laughs> and, and, and there really is an emoji for everything. So I, exactly. I, I'm sure it would be fine. Right. Uh, Stephen mentioned it, I believe, uh, a couple of minutes ago, and he was saying he, he doesn't you know, believe that they would launch something and close it down straight you know, so quickly, which brings us nicely onto what was suggested to be our other kind of topic to dive into this week, which is uh, Amazon. And there's been an interesting report kicking around this week. Uh, it was penned by Brian Novak of Morgan Stanley. He's uh, suggested that uh, Amazon may be keen on entering travel um, bracket again, as we well know. I mean, Air, uh, Amazon, God, we've been talking too much about Airbnb. Amazon has um, done various things in the travel industry before. Uh, the most recent one was launched with, I would say, a fair degree of fanfare. We wrote a lot about it. And uh, I think within four or five months, it was um, quietly shuttered, as uh, mm -hmm. the Americans say, rather than the word shut. We'll just let say that one. But anyway, so uh, I, I want to just broadly, what do, you, what do you three of you think about Amazon and travel generally, and specifically what Brian has been saying about you know, it coming up against, it has an opportunity to go up against them because of scale, them being OTAs again. Uh, can I take that one first? You go uh, for it, Stephen. So Amazon is all about controlling the supply chain, right? I mean, on their retail side, they have, they own their warehouses, 
they provide the suppliers these these you know little little manufacturers and stuff with basically the ability to ship their products and then Amazon takes care of the rest so they they have a history of being very very good at optimizing the supply chain and controlling it and squeezing out every penny from every step that they can and thereby reducing the cost to the consumer for what would normally be a lot of intermediary steps. So if they can do that with travel, so let's take hotels, for example, they, they have a huge enough footprint and a large enough um, cash base that they could acquire technologies um, to, in order to simplify the supply chain. If they can do that and cut out a bunch of the middleware that exists currently and optimize payments because they have a very good payments platform, if they can save money on payments, if they can save money on distribution, and, and they have the retail infrastructure in place, they could stand to make a lot of money selling travel, Pro probably predominantly hotels because that would be kind of the easiest, highest margin, highest volume kind of segment to, to address first. Um, and, it's, and it's relatively automated now. And imagine if, if Amazon provided hoteliers, like the, the ones that have maybe not so great PMS products or whatever now, with, hey, use Amazon's PMS, to, you know, and you've got distribution into, into Amazon. Oh, and you'll also have your, you know, you'll have your connectivity, your Expedia and booking and all those other ones as well, but we'll take a little piece of every transaction that goes through the network. That's, that's a significant opportunity for them. Uh, and not outside of the, the realm of their current model from a retail perspective as well as from a technology perspective. So, I mean, it therefore does beg the question, I mean, maybe Valen, you can go first. They've been doing this, you know, but they've tried it before um, and they reined it in very, very quickly. I just wonder why do we think that was? I mean, if if what Stephen is saying, it seems so... And bleeding obvious that they should be doing it. So why have they not bothered continuing what they've tried before, Valen? Well, speaking specifically to the hotel space, I mean that um, vertical ownership of the hotel space is well nigh impossible right now because there are multiple stakeholders in in the hotel industry. There's the asset owners. Um, there's the operators who actually run the businesses in the buildings, and then there's the brands who put their big signs on the buildings. And so you have – currently you have three stakeholders, and so it's quite difficult. I mean, it's not like – they can't, they, can't, they can't just buy – I mean, they could buy Marriott as an example, but they just get the brand and all the pieces that come with the brand, the central res and maybe the revenue management piece. Um, but they wouldn't be buying the buildings, and they wouldn't be buying the operations. And so – um, I see. I, I, I honestly, and I'm sure Robert has a has a, a unique perspective on this, but I, I see a play for Amazon in the hotel space specifically on the distribution side, but it's just not very clear to me. I see I see an easier play for Amazon in car rental as an example, where you buy the fleet, you buy the brand, you you own it, right? You own it outright. Um, now, car rental is pretty, it's not very sexy, but, and it's commoditized, but, you know, it's, it's an easier vertical ownership than hotels or even cruise lines. You buy the, you buy the boat, you buy the brand, you, you own everything. Um, so, so it's, I, I see less, I see less, it's, it's less clear to me how Amazon would, could make a difference in hotels other than distribution. That's what Amazon does, though, is the distribution, right? right? I mean, they don't own any of the product. They don't own the widgets. Somebody owns the widgets, but they control the distribution of that widget all the way from warehouse right through to retail with redistribution in the middle. And they're, they're saving money at every level while, you know, generating revenue off of uh, service fees and, and credit card fees and all those other things. So it, they've, they've kind of created this, this service model where they can generate revenue by saving costs that normally exist in the existing supply chain. Right. So if they can reduce that supply chain and extract money out of it through credit card fees and by reducing distribution costs and all those other things, then that's where they're going to – I mean, they're, they're primarily a technology company. 
they're not a they're not a hotelier. So I mean, they're not going to care about operations or buying hotels. Right. What they're going to be interested in is taking that that hotel and selling it to the consumer at a lower cost to the operation of the business. So it's going to be a lower cost to distribute and, and lower cost for for payment processing. So all those other little things where everybody pays that little extra bit that all gets added up at the end, that's where they're going to make the money. And it, it is yeah. it is a, a natural extension of their existing Amazon marketplace, isn't it? Where other sellers come in and they you can buy t-shirts from somebody and Amazon is just the facilitator. Right. Exactly. Well, and yeah. and the big thing is they have 90 million, which I believe is the, the number, at least that's what was released. Um, somebody picked that out of a, a 10K or something last September. 90 million Prime members, which is a very, yeah. very this is where it, that's just large interesting, isn't it? number it's of, yeah. and the average Prime member spends, I can't remember the multiple versus an average person, but you know, they're now, they've got video, right? You've got video tacked in, you've got all these different benefits, you certainly get overnight shift, you've now got Whole Foods for your groceries and that sort of thing. Um, I'll get into the brand crushing later, but with the uh, with what they're doing, that is very, very powerful, and if you could say, yeah, sell your hotel through Amazon, and you know what? Amazon Prime members save three percent, five percent. I don't know, whatever that number is. Well, they've got a ready-made. Right? They've got a ready-made loyalty scheme in. Or with it, in it is. Prime is the best loyalty scheme in existence on the planet, right? And I mean, it's it's easy to use. Um, they already have all the stats, certainly based on people who they're willing to pay more for something on Prime just because they trust it. it. Like, oh, it comes in the same amount of time it costs, I don't know, it's flagged as Prime, that's fine. I'll go I'll go do that. So um, outrageously, outrageously powerful um, tool there. So the other side is what Amazon makes in the margins for selling all these products, which is just by odd coincidence, around 15%, huh? Go figure. <laughs> so, you know, and now it varies. I mean, on some of the things like cell phones and consumer electronics, it's like eight, right? Because the margins aren't that great in those in those personal computers that go down to six. But most of the other stuff is around 15. They go a little bit higher on some things, I think maybe jewelry or something like that, or you know, certain items. But that 15% is what they're pulling in. And if they can kind of make those numbers work, again, if you're an independent hotelier and you go, gee, well, can I go market directly to Amazon Prime members and give them a deal and I don't need a brand anymore and I might not need an OTA anymore. I might still work with them, but I don't know. You know, it's not as important. Um, it's a that's a pretty tell, powerful value proposition. To tell me though, why do you think, you know, I raised this point a couple of seconds ago, a couple of minutes ago, why do you think then that they, started something two or three years oh. ago and closed it again so quickly. Oh, no, no. They started in 2000. They, this yeah, is the, I mean, fifth, the, the, the fourth or fifth recent, time. Most, yeah, the most recent iteration of it was about three years ago, oh. and they yeah. made a fair amount of fuss of it, about it, yeah. and then they quietly yeah. closed it down. Right, because what they did was they tried to go kind of do what Airbnb is doing, kind of let's go gather hotels up, and they were all kind of tied into these local regional experiences, and they they didn't have a broad footprint of distribution or anything like that. So they didn't have that much product. It wasn't that well promoted. I think it really was a test of seeing how they could roll up a number of, you know, smallish little, a lot of them were bed and breakfasts and, and little mm. vacation leisure travel spots. And that's a huge cost for them to go, you know, contract all those, figure out how they're going to book with it, interface to God knows what those hotels have as PMSs. It's just not efficient. And as Stephen said, their optimization of the supply chain, I think they looked at it and, and threw up on it. You know, once they started looking at those numbers, like, <laughs> how fast can we can we kill it with fire was probably right. one of the questions in, in the well, meeting. I, I think that's one of the points here is that if Amazon really does come after the hotel space, let's say, um, I think the disruptive effect would be tremendous on the sort of legacy business structure of the industry. Oh yeah, yeah. It's they do kill brands. I right. mean, the the bottom line. Look at the gross, and you can go through vertical after after vertical. Um, I'm I'm a huge fan. Valen knows of um, oh Scott Galloway at, at L2 Inc. 
he has a great little great little video um, thing, four minutes that he does like every week, winners and losers in the digital age. But he's had some great things on on Amazon of going through the impact on these verticals. So with the grocery business, they bought Whole Foods for, I think it was a neighborhood of $14 million or something like that. Their share price and their market cap went up $18 billion when they announced that. It was more than what they were going to pay. And when you aggregated out all the the cratering of all the competitive shares in, in the grocery space, it was like $25 billion or so. I mean, it was just catastrophic just by them saying, hey, we're going to go do this. And now they do. They mention that in various verticals, and, you know, they, they sneeze, and those verticals get a cold um, is, is kind of what, what happens. So are we almost on the verge then of, you know, We've, we've, we've spent a lot of time, 25 minutes, talking about Airbnb and what it might be able to do. And we've just been talking about Amazon. Do you think we're finally at a stage where we may get some, you know, to Valen's point just now, some genuine disruption to the old models across the industry, not just hotels? Because those on the outside, whether they're Amazon or whether they're Google or whatever, have spent a lot of time looking and thinking about how all this works and how arguably some of it doesn't work and trying to figure out how they can get a one a piece of the action and two do it in a more efficient way oh ab absolutely i think the industry is prime for for disruption and it has been it has been for years because again for the the typical hotelier if you're if you're a hotel owner you are probably paying in in most cases um, a brand, which again, I think the average is like 12% in the U.S., something like that. Um, then you wind up with a situation you may be paying a professional management company, all these guys like Sage or Interstate, which most travelers haven't heard of, but they're the guys who are running these, operating the hotels. You're paying them 3% of gross revenues, let's say. You're paying American Express or Visa or those guys a couple, you know. Two to four percent of of everything, and you start at, and then if it goes through an OTA, it's going up to you know another fifteen. All of a sudden, you're at over a third of your gross revenue going somewhat. I mean, the hotel brands may say that hey, we're on your side, Mr. Hotel Owner and the manager, but hey, they have their own P and Ls to run. They've got their own shareholders to to satisfy. That's a lot of intermediary take out of yeah. the out of the industry, and that's not sustainable. For these owners, um, and right now it's okay because for the U.S. hotel industry, most of Europe and most around the world, it's at record hotel occupancies, which is great. But boy, the next downturn that hits, that things are going right. to get ugly. Yeah, I, I think we're also at the point in, uh, or just the point in time, where the market caps of these companies is so huge that they actually have the ability to to make a significant impact on other verticals. Sabre, for example, has a market cap of $6 billion. That's pretty good. Amazon has a market cap of $766 billion. So if Amazon wanted to buy all the GDSs, they could probably do that and, you know, and all the OTAs and still have cash left over. So, I mean, we're talking about, you know, we're talking about a totally different scale. Amazon right. has the ability to buy up pretty much all of the assets in the travel space and completely fundamentally change it if it wanted to. Now, we're right, but they that, have, but, I don't but, know. But Amazon, but yeah, Amazon has, has no interest in that. that. Yeah, yeah, but they have no interest in that because where's all their money? A vast majority of their profit comes from Amazon Web Services. So they would much rather not buy Sabre but say, Saber, get the stuff on AWS. We can lower your costs, <laughs> and you know your your um, you know all those expenses on your IT. We can make yeah. those go away if you do some things, yeah. and they're getting paid paid to do that. Yeah. So, but you know, there's, why there's not? nothing to stop. I mean, if they were if they really wanted to, there is no reason why Amazon could not enter the space, offer a dis offer a uh, you know a supply all the way through distribution technology stack that involved everything from PMS to distribution mm -hmm. to switch to whatever entirely on the Amazon platform and offer that to hotels for free mm -hmm. and completely disrupt the hotel technology space. And they could do that because they've got 
money in the bank to do it, and they would control the entire infrastructure. Yeah. I personally don't think I don't think they'll spend the money on doing that. I think they'll have the industry spend whatever money to go do that, and then maybe they'll you know their APIs that they expose for travel would be how do you you know how do you do this most efficiently, and then they'll provide some hey why don't you just host your stuff on our right. you know on our platform, and when they do that, all of a sudden they can have instantaneous access because that's the single image of the inventory mm-hmm. isn't out at the hotel CRS or out in some building or out distributed wherever it's sitting on Amazon anyway. They go oh. Hey, we know where that is. We can get to that really quick. Right. So, are you going to jump in there, Dan? Sir? No, I think I think actually, Robert, I would agree with Robert's point of view um, that they would build it. I mean, because you know why so the the GDS is you know, there's a lot of legacy technology out there, um, and it you know it's it's robust and scale and it scales, it, but it's really expensive. And so, if I was Amazon, I wouldn't. Wouldn't really, I wouldn't buy those. I would actually move more towards Robert's point of view, which is, you know, just keep adding, keep adding, you know, just keep building it out for us. Just keep adding that stuff to the web services and and uh, connecting via the API. And then all of a sudden, one day we wake up and they've got it all. That's certainly what's happened in a lot of other industries. Right. <laughs> and, and again, you start looking at um, these industries in the fast you know, fashion industry and things like that where they were fighting Amazon and trying to stay off of it. And, and Amazon did start working with them to say, hey, we'll help, you know, some of the people doing knockoffs and things like that off the platform, but work with us. Amazon's now one of their largest sectors to sell. And they're going, hey, we're selling more on Amazon than we are in the department store. Let's, you know, and these numbers are working out better for us. Um, this is great. We can, you know, we can put those racks of dresses and stuff sending out to all those stores. Just, you know, ship it to Amazon. They take care of it. That's not bad. So it's interesting. I mean, Amazon is 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 acting as a conduit at the moment as well through the uh, the voice technology. You know, Alexas and things oh, like absolutely. that. Oh, absolutely. So, mm-hmm. yep. so, uh, and that's another element in all this, isn't it? It's the it's the right. interface between all those in inverted commas skills that allow people to search and do whatever from for, for with a travel brand, but that's done through an Amazon owned device as well. Absolutely and voice is the future and Amazon oh, yeah. has has certainly got a strongly now Google's done some very interesting things. Apple yeesh, I don't know. We'll see. They've they've lost a lot of a lot of ground to those yeah, two, I mean, but, but Amazon is is killing it in in, in voice, voice and voice yeah. search and travel is just so intuitive, right? Yeah, show me show me show me beach resorts uh, in Sharm El Sheikh uh, in May. Show me you know show me show me all properties within three miles of Javits in New York City. I mean, I mean over these dates, that's so it's so intuitive. Right, yeah. but tied on to Amazon's great recommendation engine, exactly. which I, which I yeah. believe they had originally gotten way back in the 90s, I, I mm-hmm. believe from some guys at um, at so University of Minnesota. Yeah. Net Perceptions, yeah. right. Yeah. And that uh, was a very, very cool engine, which at the time they were testing with beer recommendations, which was very nice. But, but, <laughs> but Amazon took it a little further than that. I think movies and beer. Um, but again, with their ability to to really leverage that that um, aspect of it, where they know here's what these people like, here's what they buy, here's the, the clothes they wear, the movies they watch. Yeah. All of a sudden, if you can start making, you know, we we're talking about Airbnb making good recommendations to match that traveler to the best experience. Um, Amazon has some pretty interesting data there to go say. Hey Alexa, book me a um, you know book me a hotel in New York, Absolutely. you know the 25th yeah. through the 28th. Absolutely. And so, I, I, of course, okay. the other, the other, yeah, you see, <laughs> and the other the other part of it is that you know if Amazon is selling you the trip to I don't know from America over to Paris, it can also cross sell you the camera that you will need. Take your and, the, and, the, and the luggage and, and yeah everything. Yeah. Yeah. And <laughs> if they get clever. If they get okay. clever, they can start bundling things and say, you know, because you'll see if you buy these two things together, you can get this. And all of a sudden, they'll be like, hey, if I buy some luggage and do this, I can go, I can upgrade. Uh, that's great. So, right. yeah, they can do some very, very powerful things. Um, and, again, selling hypothetically all hotel brands. 
I mean, if, if they start, if they go into this in, our, in a serious way, right, and kind of do it right, not just as a test, like, no, we're seriously, we think this is the, the way and, and the time to exploit this, I've got to think the hotels, they, they don't want to get shut out of the 90 million, well, Right now, it's 90 million members. I don't know how many it is in the in the future, but it's a it's a crazy, crazy huge. No, I mean, more people have Amazon Prime memberships than vote in U.S. presidential elections, well, or own guns, or that's own guns, for another podcast, or own <laughs> guns. Yeah, another another hot. Come on, let's talk about guns, Kevin. No, that would be good for fun. <laughs> let's not talk about guns. <laughs> so, no, but I mean, it's a it's a staggeringly huge number of people who love they love the product the net promoter score of of prime is is i don't know the latest it's well into the upper 90s which interestingly airbnb is as well right people love these products and i think that interview with brian chesky he made the great point of y combinator saying when you do a startup Build something that a hundred people love, not a million, just a hundred, and then figure it out. And I think both of these companies wound up, yeah, you know, doing that and have been able to scale it. What we should do is ask Brian Chesky if he's scared of Amazon. That will kind of tie our two conversations together here. So he should um, be. <laughs> right, indeed. So um, in a blink of an eye, we've actually got to an, almost an hour. So um, that wasn't the intention. We were. I think we were expecting maybe half. So um, thank you very much um, for uh, joining us, uh, Robert, Stephen, and uh, Valen. The uh, podcast here will be available in all the usual outlets as we figure out where we're going to place this, but we'll be hosting it on Focuswire, of course. Um, but yes, yeah, so thanks ever so much. Uh, uh, just a little bit of housekeeping, Focusrite Europe is coming up in about seven weeks in Amsterdam. We'll be there. Uh, we hope many of you are there as well. So focusrighteurope.com. Um, and we will see how uh, the next few weeks shake out. We want to get to a stage where we're probably doing these on a weekly basis. So that said, Robert and Stephen and Valen, we may well be calling on you again. We would love to hear from you if that's OK with you three. Anytime, Kevin. That's fine. And I can't believe you thought it would be – you've known the three of us for a long time, Kevin, and you really thought it would be 30 minutes? Really? Especially, especially with Robert. Yeah. Uh, it, it, it's not for me to judge or to pass comments. So, <laughs> so uh, uh, but the, the three of you, thank you very much for joining us on uh, number nine of the Pundit Show, and uh, thanks, everyone, to, for, for listening and tuning in. So thank you very much. Cheerio. Everyone.